the coming of the Lord. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Now, brothers, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep. Let us not be let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that, whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. Thanks, Gina. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that um, you've given us the scriptures to, to speak your mind and speak your heart to us and to inform us and to transform us. And I pray, Lord, that, that you would do that this morning, that we would hear information that would sink into our minds, and that we would be transformed by your Spirit in our hearts to live differently, to live according to the way you've called us to live. So Lord, I just pray that you would uh, take these weak words that I've written and use your powerful word, Lord, to speak to our hearts. Lord, please give me the strength to do this and take this time. It's yours. Do whatever you like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So beginning today and for the next five weeks, we're going to continue to look at the Apostles' Creed and some of the key elements, some of the key beliefs of the Christian church. Now, all of us are at different places in our journey in the Christian life, and I never want to assume that everyone has an understanding of what we as Christians believe. What are the basic and essential beliefs that provide the basis for how we live our lives? Now, the Apostles' Creed, which we, read, which we read before, was developed in the early centuries of the church in order to provide kind of like a summary statement of Christian, of, of Christian beliefs. Its points were agreed to by all the leaders of the early church as a means of setting the parameters of orthodox belief. Now, while the Creed doesn't cover everything there is to know about God and about our lives, as Christians, it does cover the basics in such a way that any belief that would be the opposite to anything that we see in the creed would be deemed to be outside of orthodox Christianity. In other words, Christian, Christians could recite and adhere to the creed without an issue. Their lives and beliefs would line up with the creed. So we spent three months before the Christmas Advent, before December, going through the creed line by line. And we want to pick that up now starting again this morning at the line, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And this speaks about Jesus, who after his crucifixion on the cross and after his resurrection, bodily ascended into heaven. And the promise described in this line is that Jesus will come again. In fact, the angel at the ascension made that promise to the disciples who watched as Jesus rose into the sky. In Acts 1.11, the angel tells the disciples that Jesus will come back in the same way 
they had seen him go into heaven. So based on this promise, the creed tells us that Jesus will, in fact, come again, and that the purpose for his coming will be to judge the living and the dead. Now, as I approached this line in the Apostles' Creed, I found this to be a somewhat difficult subject to, to, to talk about, and one that, to be honest, I wasn't entirely looking forward to, for a couple of reasons. One is that we're looking at a subject that's in the future. And though the Bible does give indications of what will happen, some of these indications are presented in ways that are kind of mysterious and open to interpretation and left somewhat unclear. And as such, there are people will like to speculate, you know, what will happen at the end of time, and especially people will like to speculate when the end of time will happen. But when push comes to shove, only God, only God the Father knows when the end of time will come. Mark 13, 32, Jesus himself says that about that day or hour, no one knows, not the angels in heaven, not even the Son. He says, not even, I don't even know. But only the Father knows when the time will come, when Jesus will come again. If even the Son of God doesn't know when it will happen, how presumptuous it is of us to try and set exact dates of when it might happen. The second reason why this line in the Apostles' Creed is a difficult subject to teach on is, is the use of the word judge. That's become a taboo word in today's society, and even in the church. Many discussions about right and wrong are responded to with phrases like, don't judge me. Who are you to judge what I do? But the scriptures tell us that there will be a judgment at the end of time, and that the judgment rests in the hands of Jesus. John 5.22 tells us that God the Father has given that honor of judging to the Son. Hebrews 9.27 tells us that all humans are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So much for reincarnation, or purgatory for that matter. This one life is the gift God has given us to live. And we are called to cooperate with him to discover his purpose for our lives and to make the most out of this one life that we're given. It may be hard to wrap our heads around what Jesus coming again means, and it may be uncomfortable to talk about judgment, but both of these concepts are part of the gospel, the complete gospel. And though we may not be able to do it complete justice in the next 19 and a half minutes, we're going to give it a try. Jesus will come again. It's a promise. It's our hope. And yet our natural curiosity isn't always satisfied with that simple promise. And, and we end up wanting to know, well, when and how is it all going to happen? I looked up what the Baptist Church believes on this subject since I wasn't brought up Baptist. And, and I looked up at the CBOQ What We Believe document, quite a good document. But it really doesn't expand too much on this subject. It simply says, Christ will come again. And only God the Father knows when and how our Lord will return. And then as far as judgment is concerned, it says that we shall all stand under the final judgment of God, receiving the divine verdict on our lives. There may be wisdom in the, the sparseness of information in this document. I grew up in a de denomination where the end times was often discussed. And in some circles, it was often argued about and disagreed upon, and would at times even cause divisions among Christians. People would argue about whether they were pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib or premillennial or amillennial, what you believed about the intermediate state, all these things that only usually theologians worry about. And honestly, these arguments kind of soured me on delving into the topic of the end times because I didn't want to get tied up into arguing about something that was going to happen in the future and that we weren't even 100% sure how it was going to happen. But I know that there, are, there is a natural human curiosity about future events. And the Bible does give us some guidance about what is going to happen. And I know I've been asked recently by one of our youth about what some of these certain things mean regarding future events. So let me try and give a Reader's Digest version of what I've always been taught and, and what I grew up believing while understanding that, especially in this subject, there are other Christians of good faith who may have totally different views. 
When we die as believers, we are immediately with God. 2 Corinthians 5a tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. We are with, there's no soul sleep. We are with the Lord in soul and spirit, but we're not with him in body. At the end of time, we will be with him in glorified body, similar to the post-resurrection body that Jesus had. The end times will bring about that final bodily resurrection of the just and the unjust. Things on earth will get worse and worse and worse until the end of time. And I think that's one reason there, why there have been people in every generation of the church who were convinced that they were living in the last days because things just keep getting worse. I read a Christian publication from 1925 and they were convinced that Benito Mussolini was the Antichrist and that Jesus would come again in 1933. Didn't happen, just in case you're wondering. Didn't, it didn't, didn't happen. But when the final end of things does come, there will rise up a person who will be hailed as a leader who will solve all the world's problems, or many of them, and will bring the world to a new place of peace and safety. And this will seem to be the case for a few years, but eventually this leader, known as the Antichrist, will turn and be seen for what he is, the dictator of all dictators. I was talking to someone this week about the book Animal Farm. Do you still read that in high school? George Orwell's Animal Farm. It's one of the few books in high school that I actually liked. Um, it was George Orwell was a communist, and then he converted away from it and went to the total other extreme. And so he published this book in the 1940s as a satire on communism. And he likened communism to a farm where the animals wanted to run things for themselves. So they had a rebellion, and they chased the farmers away and took over with a pig called Snowball. And Snowball took charge. I think that was his name. And Snowball was a good and well-respected leader. And they made a list of rules for their new society. And they put them up on the barn door. And the first rule was, all animals are created equal. But over time, some animals became unhappy with Snowball's leadership. And they wanted to take charge themselves. And they gathered under another pig. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a coincidence that Orwell chose the pigs to be the leaders in this case. But they gathered another the pig named Napoleon, I think was his name, right? And um, before long, they took over by force. They took over the farm, and they began to treat the other animals poorly. And one day, the animals looked at the barn door when they woke up and noticed the change in the rules. And it said, all animals are created equal, but some are more equal than others. And eventually, the pigs in charge started walking up on their hind legs and welcomed back the farmers and joined with the farmers in running the farm. And all the anim other animals looked into the farmhouse from the outside and realized that they were going to be treated even worse than they were had they, when they started out. And that's what happened in communist countries throughout the 20th century and even today. And it is what will happen over the entire world when the Antichrist begins to rule. It will start off okay, and then it will get worse. And the world will be as far away from God as it has ever been. But God will not allow it to continue. Now, the first thing that will happen is something called the rapture. This is when Jesus will come and take his church home to be with him before the world gets to the place where it just destroys itself. 1 Corinthians 4, 13 to 18 tells us, which Gina read, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. At the rapture, Christ will return from heaven with a shout, and the dead in Christ will rise first and give in their resurrection body. And those of the church alive at the time will simply just leave, caught up in the air, to meet the Lord in the air. 
Now, when I was growing up, I think I had a bit of an unhealthy view of the rapture, of Jesus coming to take his church home. The knowledge that it could happen at any time kind of unnerved me as a kid, and as, even as a teenager. I saw it as something to be feared, uncertain as to whether I was worthy enough or not to be included amongst the church that would be taken up to be with Jesus. But I think I've grown up, as I hope I have, and I think I've developed a bit of a healthier view. The first thing to realize is just how huge God's grace is, how amazing, and it's just much, God's grace is much greater than we could ever imagine. Second Peter 3.9 tells us that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. See, the Lord is not looking for a time for Jesus to come back to try and catch as many people off guard as possible. In fact, it's just the opposite. He is wanting everyone possible to come to repentance, to come to know the salvation, to come to know the forgiveness of sins that Jesus offers, to come to know the grace of God. Secondly, even though I was discussing this on Wednesday with a couple of people, we realized that the word rapture itself is not in the Bible, it is used to properly describe how Christians should and will feel when Jesus comes again. Rapture means great joy, uh, bliss, ecstasy, great delight. The idea of Jesus coming again should fill our hearts with great delight. For at that time, we shall see him as he is. And we shall know him in a way that goes so far beyond any way that we've known him up to this point. Thirdly, the rapture, Jesus coming again, is our hope. It's a hope that no matter how bad things get in this world, that Jesus is still in charge, and that one day he'll put a stop to the madness. It's a hope that we will be loosened from this body that is prone to sickness and disease and sin and temptation, and we will live with our Lord in the way that he created us to live, and we'll be there forever. I mentioned last week I was I'm reading a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's a book about slavery in the 1850s. And so many of the songs that the slaves sang, songs we call Negro spirituals today, had themes about, about Jesus coming again, about themes about being rescued from this earth and brought to heaven, being brought home to be with the Lord. And these songs were not sung out of fear or apprehension. These songs were songs of hope. In the misery of slavery, the messages of these songs were often their only hope. Swing low, sweet chariot coming for to carry me home. They saw the return of Christ as deliverance from their difficult lives. May we too see the return of Christ, the rapture, not as something that produces anxiety, but rather something that produces hope. Fourthly, the fact that Jesus is coming again for his church needs to be motivation to us. Titus 2, 11, 13 tells us, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul in 2 Timothy 4, 7, 8 says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness with which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. What motivates Titus in this passage to live a godly, upright life is the blessed hope that he is waiting for, the appearing again of Jesus. And Paul tells Timothy that what drove him to finish the race and to fight the good fight was a longing for the appearing of Christ. Now, I don't want to give the wrong impression that we are to live the Christian life out of fear of the Lord's coming, out of fear of failing the test, but rather we want to live the Christian life out of the joy of passing the test, out of the joy that in knowing that with the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us, we can pass every test that comes our way in life. We live the Christian life not out of fear that if, if we don't, we'll be sent away from God's presence, but rather 
We live our Christian life for the joy of, of one day hearing our Father say, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. So we long for his appearing as we look forward with hope to when he comes again while we are alive or with hope to being present with him in death. However it is, we are motivated to live a life that pleases him, that fulfills the purpose that we were created for. And we are motivated to share with others the gospel of Christ, the salvation that is found in Christ, so that they too might look to the appearing of the Lord, not with fear and trepidation, but with hope and a desire to see him face to face as well. For the flip side of the blessed hope of his appearing is the judgment that all will face at the end of time. Once the Antichrist has taken full power, a great battle will take place, scriptures tell us, that will be focused on Israel and Jerusalem. This is one reason why, why, while I never, ever, ever like to set dates, you know, or make predictions, I tend to feel like the end of time and the coming of the Lord might be closer now than in generations past because of the restoration of the nation of Israel in 1948 and how so much of the politics and the arguing and the fighting in the world centers around this one little insignificant country in the Middle East and also around this otherwise obscure city of Jerusalem. Now before this battle called the Battle of Armageddon comes to a point of destroying the earth, the Lord will step in. And the second coming of Christ will occur, occur, and the Antichrist will be defeated. And Jesus will rule and reign on earth for a thousand years, what theologians call the millennium. And after that will come the final judgment and the ushering in of the new heaven and the new earth. Believers will come before what is called the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And those who have rejected Christ will appear before what scriptures call the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, 11, 15 describes that terrible day when the book of life is opened and the dead are judged according to what they had done. And those who have ignored God throughout their entire lives will get their wish and they'll be able to ignore God forever. There's a few things to understand about the final judgment. The first is that God is fully entitled to make this judgment. We as humans are told in scriptures that we shouldn't judge, lest we ourselves be judged, because we're imperfect. And, and our judgment is flawed, and it's filled with emotion and self-serving motivations, and we don't know the whole truth. But God is perfect and just. And he is worthy to judge all of humanity according to what we have done. And secondly, when we stand on that judgment day, we stand on that judgment day alone. No excuses, no one else to blame. Over the holidays, I got to watch one of my favorite movies with my, with my parents. It's called 42. And it's the story of Jackie Robinson, who overcame racism to become the first African-American baseball player in Major League Baseball back in 1947. And the other main character in the story, besides Jackie Robinson, is a fellow named Branch Rickey, who was the owner and manager, general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And it was his idea to end the blockade of African-American players in baseball and bring a player, the first African-American player. And Rickey was a religious man and a great champion of equal rights. But the other owners of Major League Baseball were not. And there's a great scene in this movie when Branch Rickey is talking on the phone to the owner of the Philadelphia Phillies. And this other owner is refusing to have the Phillies take the field to play against the Dodgers as long as Robinson, an African-American, is part of the team. Now, Rickey, who I said was a religious man, asks the Phillies owner if he believes in God. And Rickey then says with increasing anger, one day you will stand before your maker. And when he asks why you would not allow your team to play against Robinson, and you answer it was because he was a Negro, that may not prove to be a sufficient enough reply. One day we will all stand before our maker in judgment. And like that baseball owner, we'll be tempted to make excuses. But God, I, I, God, I was lonely. I, I was angry. I was tired. God, it was their fault. It was their fault. They pushed me to it. 
you don't understand, God. God, I was poor. I had no choice. God, I had a bad upbringing. What did you expect? Oh, God, what about them? <laughs> They're so much worse than I am, God. Why, why are you picking on me? You see, when we stand before God as judge, we can't pass the buck. We're guilty as charged if we stand before him alone. So what do we do? We bring a lawyer. We bring an advocate. We bring someone who is going to speak in our defense. 1 John 1.9 says that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And then chapter 2 goes on to say, I write this to you that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. If we invite Jesus into our lives as Savior, if we ask him to forgive us of our sins and to save us, and ask his from, and if we ask his forgiveness from then on for the times we do sin, because we are human, then one of the benefits of that is that we don't walk into the final judgment alone. We walk in with Jesus. And God the Father looks at him and accepts the sacrifice of the Son on our behalf and welcomes us into his presence. Not because of any good works that we have done, but because of our faith in Jesus, and because of his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. An old gospel song has the lyrics, Now when God looks at me, he no more sees the things I've done. He only sees the blood of his crucified son. So what do we do with all this information today? How does it impact our daily lives? Well, in Mark 13, right after Jesus tells his disciples that no one except the Father knows when Jesus will come again, he then gives them, gives them this instruction. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. In other words, be prepared. Get ready. I'm going back to school this semester. We'll see if that's a good decision or not. I'm going to take one course at the university where I do my university ministry. I thought it might help me understand the students a little better and get into the school community better. And I looked at the syllabus online, and the course has two exams to it. I haven't written an exam in 20 years. <laughs> my last degree in theology was all term papers and, and reading assignments. There were no exams to it. Um, we'll see how that goes. Exams and tests produce anxiety in many people. But actually, I've always found there's one surefire way to reduce the anxiety of a test. Study. Be prepared. Walk into the exam ready. This life is really a life that is lived in preparation for the next life. And part of that preparation is to be ready, to be on guard to be alert, to be prepared. And the only way we can do that is to invite Jesus into our lives now, allowing him to take the judgment that we deserve so that we can look at being with him forever with, with true rapture, with true delight, with true joy. And that will be because, it, because of our walk with Jesus now the future and the life to come will just seem like the logical conclusion of a life well lived for Christ. One of my favorite Christian singers, Wayne Watson, has a song with these lyrics. I hope I remember them correctly. But it's one day Jesus will call my name. As days go by, I hope I don't stay the same. I want to get so close to him that there's no big change on that day when Jesus calls my name. May we live our lives this morning in the light of his appearing. May the thought of Jesus coming again bring joy and hope to our hearts, and may it motivate us to live self-controlled, godly, and upright lives, so that when the trumpet sounds, or when we are called into his presence through death, it will just seem like one continuous, uninterrupted journey with Jesus. And may the thought of his return motivate us to share his love and share his gospel with others who may not be prepared, alert, or on guard, so that they too can know the joy of sins forgiven, 
so that they too can know the fulfillment of knowing why they were created, so that they too can know the blessed hope of life with Jesus forever. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we thank you that only you, God the Father, knows when all the events of the end times are going to happen. And so let's, we're glad for that. It's too much for us to consider exact times and dates. But we thank you that you've given us an idea of what to expect and how to be prepared and how to be ready. We thank you, Lord, for that glorious day when we will see you face to face, that we will, when we will be known, we will know you as, as you know us. We will know you in a way that we've never known you before. And Lord, I pray that everyone in this room would have that confidence that they are ready and prepared, that looking ahead to Jesus coming again is, is, a, is a, a thought of joy not a fear of apprehension. Lord, I thank you for your grace, and I pray, Lord God, for anyone here who may not feel prepared, that they would just reach out and accept your grace, accept your forgiveness, and begin to walk with you now so that at death or at, come, at your second coming, we just can keep on walking with you right into heaven and into the afterlife. Thank you again, Lord, for your promises, and for making us eternal. Thank you, Lord, that this life isn't all there is. We look forward to what you have prepared for us. I mean, the thought that this life is all there is, I mean, this life is all there is, the one life that we have to live, and the thought of you coming again, Lord, may it motivate us. May it motivate us to live lives that are self-controlled, that glorify you, May it motivate us, Lord, Lord, to share your love and your truth with others. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for what it teaches us, and thank you for what it does in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.